If you're just joining, welcome to COVID Year 3, a forum examining how COVID-19 could shape our future over the next year and beyond. A special thank you to McKinsey and Company for their support and to our mini media partner, STAT. My name is Connor Goodwin, and I'm an events associate with ProPublica. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Today, we'll hear from a group of leading health experts about what we could expect from the next phase of the COVID-19 crisis. We will discuss different scenarios for how the virus might evolve and what this means for us as individuals and for society at large. Our panelists will also answer your questions. To ask a question at any point, click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type it there. Also, if you would like to enable subtitles, click on the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now, allow me to introduce our speakers. Mark Lipsich is a professor of epidemiology at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Nicole Baumgart is a professor of immunology at University of California, Davis. And Dr. Umer Shah was appointed Secretary of Health for the state of Washington in December, 2020. Lastly, our moderator today is ProPublica reporter, Caroline Chen. I'll let Caroline take it from here. Awesome, thank you, Connor. And thank you to everybody who's joining us today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with this group of experts. Um, I would like to start by defining a term or trying to define a term that has been used a lot and also misused a lot um, that we're all throwing around these days, which is what does endemic actually mean? Um, Mark, maybe you could take a stab at that. Thanks, Caroline, and thanks for the chance to be here. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot because it's really a term that has very many different meanings to different people. Uh, uh, I think in, in some people's minds, it means the time when people like us don't get invited to webinars anymore <laughs> because people have lost interest in the disease. Um, the technical meanings are, are actually several different ones, and um, I think the, the part that, that many of these definitions have in common is a sense of predictability, a sense that there might be seasonal fluctuations as there are with flu and many other diseases before we had vaccines for them. Um, and, uh, but that we can sort of guess with reasonable uh, accuracy how many people are gonna get it one in a given year and how many people uh, are gonna have severe or fatal cases in a given year. Um, and it might fluctuate a little, but, but not dramatically. Um, and the timing is also somewhat predictable. It's either always there or seasonal or something, something kind of in between. Um, I think uh, we will talk a lot more later about COVID and what it means, but, um, but I think that's the best way to think of the term endemic. Yeah, well, one thing I did not hear you say was the word mild. Um, so I just want to clarify, I see you're nodding your head here, Nicole, what, what does the endemic have to do with, I, I feel like some people yes. equate that with, it's going to be mild. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and thank you also for having me. Yeah, I think that's really important um, that it's sort of currently used as once we don't longer have to worry about it, then it's endemic, but that's really not what it is. As, as Mark already said, it, it can be um, actually predictably um, cause a high level of mortality or people getting infected. That is not what we want. So that's the kind of endemic that we are not looking for, uh, but that's also endemic, right? It can be predictable to be very bad. So I think it is uh, not a great term to use currently. We also really don't know yet where mm -hmm. all of this is going as we would discuss. Yeah. So what are the potential scenarios um, Mark, for where we could go, like what would post-pandemic look like? What are potential scenarios, best case scenario or most likely scenario? Yeah, um, there are a number and um, I, I would point people to the recent uh, article by Don Burke in Stat News that lays out some scenarios. He was one of the first people to, um, to uh, point to coronavirus as long, long ago as a potential pandemic threat. Uh, and he's worth reading again uh, at this time. Um, but I think some of the possible scenarios are first the, the more mild scenario 
which uh, involves people having most, the large majority of the population having an, a, a certain degree of immunity, at least to severe disease due to their past infection and or vaccination. Um, and a situation where that immunity lasts long enough so that by the, that in between times that people get uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2, they, um, they don't lose that immunity to severe disease. Um, less happy scenarios are uh, involve probably mostly changes in the virus um, such that that long lasting immunity to, to severe disease uh, is no longer as effective um, and maybe also immunity to transmission is, is less than it was. The first scenario is really what the seasonal coronaviruses do. They probably were once worse for us. We don't know that, but we, they probably were. And as immunity built up uh, in the population, they became milder in effect. Um, uh, but uh, so the, the real question is how often and how greatly do, does the virus change in ways that make our existing levels of immunity um, not so effective. And we just don't know what that will be. So even when we reach a stage, as I hope we are beginning to reach, of mostly mild disease and mostly smaller waves of disease, public health officials and, and those who worry about these things will need to continue to worry about the evolution of, of more uh, severe strains or more immune escaping strains, um, particularly given the large number of people in the world in places like China, but not only China, uh, that have not had infection or vaccination. Yeah, I'd like to bring uh, Umer in here at this point. What, what do you see as actions that we can be doing now or actions that people could be taking now that would shape the eventual trajectory of this virus? Because I think sometimes people also talk about this like it's going to do its own thing, but we are a factor in what happens. Well, first of all, Carolyn, thanks for having me. And, and Mark and Nicole did a great job of defining the, the where we are when, when we look ahead. And I did want to make the, the other quick comment about endemic is that as you're hearing different uh, definitions of it, I'm shying away from even using the word. It doesn't mean that we can. It's not a forbidden word to use, but it is a, a word that has so many different meanings to so many different people. And that is is really usually when we get into trouble, when we can't commonly define something. So, you know, as far as um, actions go, uh, we are absolutely, at least in this country, now there's a you know, there is something to be said about what's happening in international settings, but at least in this country, we are moving in a, in a, in a place where we are going to need to coexist with this virus for a long time coming. This is not going to, going to magically, you know, as states are removing all sorts of uh, requirements or mandates and magically the virus will disappear. The pandemic will be ongoing. So it's really, living with the virus. And when we live with the virus, there are two things that happen. One is that we take actions that protect ourselves or the people around us. And the other is that we contribute to the ecosystem of the global community. And what I mean by that is that, as we know, that when we uh, have such a large proportion of the world that is not vaccinated, then we have a more propensity for variants and other variants of concerns to, to be in the mix. At the same time, if we take our own actions to wear a mask or to, to get vaccinated or do our part, even as we coexist, which includes, you know, having those tools like tests and other uh, modalities at our disposal so that when we are out and about uh, and all of a sudden have symptoms, we don't just continue to go out and about and we actually um, cocoon ourselves, whether it's isolate, quarantine, or what have you, and we get tested and we decide what is the action we need to take. So there are individual aspects of what we're doing that also have global consequences. And then there are global consequences that really uh, have uh, meaning to those individual actions. And the impact of this global individual or global local, global domestic interface is so critical as we look at this path forward where we're gonna to have to really coexist, but also recognizing that parts of the world are further along than others when it comes to vaccinations and other kinds of activities and tools. 
Yeah, we'll talk about the sort of global picture in a little bit, but first let's maybe zoom down to um, the immune system. And I wanna ask uh, Nicole here, you know, we can also think about this as individuals and sort of as a collective here. So, you know, I've heard people say, well, we know that even if you're vaccinated, you could still have a breakthrough infection. So how does our collective action here in our collective immunity, if I can say it that way, how does that affect the trajectory of the virus? Yeah, I think that's such an important question because it, another way of phrasing the question is if, if I'm if I'm healthy and unlikely to uh, suffer severe consequences, why, why should I bother getting vaccinated, right? It's another way of asking this. And, and the answer is that every time, for the virus, it's all about replicating, right? It's all about making more of itself. And every time it finds a host in which it can replicate, every time it replicates, it will build in some mutations, uh, some tiny changes in the genome. And most of the time that doesn't make a difference, but every now and again, Again, it will make the virus a little more potent, a, a little more activated. So the more people there are that can be infected and that not only can be infected, but can harbor the virus for a long period of time. Um, so these would be the completely unvaccinated and also the uh, immunocompromised. Uh, the virus has a chance to mutate and, and make itself better and then uh, cause the next um, Outbreak, And I think we have seen that with Omicron, which we don't know where it's ca it came from, uh, but it has so many mutations, over 30 changes to its genome. And the best guess we have that it likely came from a patient who was immunocompromised and harbored this virus for a very long period of time to accumulate all these mutations. So the, le the better our immune system is, the less we have a chance for that next Omicron to come along. Yeah. So... You mentioned, you Mary, earlier, you know, living with the virus. Um, so I wanted to ask a question to Mark about this. So I feel like everybody at this point is very tired of the constant mental calculations they're making of risk benefit, particularly for parents of young kids um, or people who have immunocompromised loved ones. What does that look like as we sort of move into a more post pandemic world where COVID's, you know, the coronavirus is still out there? Um, are we going to have to continue to constantly be making these risk calculations or what, what might that look like? It's really hard to say for sure, but I, what I imagine is likely is that, the, um, that there will be periods when we forget and uh, where, we, you know, <laughs> where our attention is elsewhere, uh, as seems to be happening now. I'm in London right now and uh, with the Ukraine events and, and other things, COVID is really, uh, and the announcement of living with COVID as an official government policy, it's really, uh, you can see a change. Um, so I think there will be periods where people go about their business, some more cautious people mask and some uh, take other precautions. Um, and then I think we have to assume a, a significant chance that there will be waves of future variants that, um, that make us have to go back to some of the more careful calculations and behaviors uh, mm -hmm. that, that people have been used to during the big surges in this pandemic. Um, we all hope that doesn't happen, uh, but I think the until we see a long, very long period of several years with uh, no events, and even then we might be still nervous, uh, I think the, the public health world has to be on alert for, for looking for signs of, of upsurges, but I think most people uh, will have periods where we're, where we're not thinking about COVID all the time. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, you know, initially, obviously, when we were still learning about the coronavirus and the pandemic had just started, there were a lot of changes to the way we lived that were supposed to be temporary um, and some that definitely were like, you know, uh, lockdowns or things like that. But are there any changes that you can see becoming more ingrained in our society and lifestyles going forward um, from your position um, as you think about sort of a population level? Yeah, Carolyn, you know, the way I look at it is that we, we, whomever all of us are, the billions across the globe will never be the same um, after this, after this uh, pandemic. And, you know, the post pandemic world, which we're not there yet, but um, 
it, there is no doubt that we have gone through an incredible collective and individual set of experiences that mean uh, means a lot for how we uh, go about our daily lives. And so even if it's as you know as simple as having a mask that we we put on that none of us or many of us never thought we would be putting on in 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 public settings, um, or people are coming to your home and you're asking questions about their health. Uh, I mean, how 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 often do we do that at dinner parties where somebody would you know say, hey, gosh, I, I'm going to make sure you get tested before you come into my home. I mean, these are things that have really transformed. But but even broadly, more collectively, you know, how we go about our business, you know, uh, tele commuting, tele working, uh, schools with, and and although it did not go so well with uh, tele education. But we do now at least have capabilities of being able to do those things. And obviously, there's a big equity gap that we have to be mindful of. So I think we have we have absolutely transformed. The other piece of this, and Mark has brought this up as well a couple of times, is in public health. And and I do think about this very very much every day as being a public health official. And and you know all these years of being healthcare and public health. Um, as an ED physician, it was always about quick decisions. In public health, it was always about these long deliberative processes to get to a, a decision point. This pandemic changed that. We have not had that, that, that time to be able to deliberate for the long term because the pandemic, the virus, something changed the very next day. So the reason I bring that up is that I do wonder what our field will be like in the future. I know there are gonna be opportunities to be deliberative and methodical, but I also think that our pace is gonna be markedly different based on this collective experience of making decisions very quickly. And even sometimes when you don't have all the information and you still have to make a decision. Yeah. So one group of people I'd really like to address and maybe Nicole, you could take this question is people who are immunocompromised. And this you know, was a frequent uh, theme in the questions we got from the audience ahead of this panel. So there are a lot of people who are immunocompromised who feel like they're basically being left behind, that everybody is saying, oh, we're returning to normal, but, you know, they may know that, you know, they may not have produced uh, as strong a response to the vaccines or know that if they have a breakthrough infection that, you know, they're at much higher risk. So what is your advice for people who are immunocompromised um, and, you know, feel like they're being left behind here? And what do you think is the trajectory for people who are in that position? Yeah, it is most unfortunate because in at the end of the day, they are definitely more vulnerable and they will have to, and, and they were more vulnerable before COVID and they remain so now, but now there's this threat of COVID on top of everything. So, I mean, obviously um, in close contact with their primary care um, physician and getting tested and not just vaccinated, but if they can get tested of whether their vaccine actually produced a measurable result, because it may take a number of vaccines more than uh, the healthy person needs to develop this immune response. So if we make these recommendations about boosters, about the uh, particular in this group of immunocompromised, about their actual response, which would be very different from person to person, uh, this sort of more uh, personalized medicine, I think would be very important. And then um, talking to their friends and um, um, and, and family about the importance of them basically being vaccinated and protected for that individual and provide this buffer around them so that their likelihood of getting infected is, is smaller. So there's really unfortunately no ma magic bullet of how they can be protected. Um, but, but those are some things that I think are really important. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to turn to the global picture a little bit. So Mark, earlier you mentioned, you know, uh, large countries that may have populations that are still um, where there isn't a high proportion of vaccination. So how do global vaccine disparities affect the tra trajectory of this pandemic and sort of how different countries might experience the next year? Yeah, well, I think the, there are a few things that are clear and a few things that are harder to figure out. I think one of the things that's clear is that China in particular as the largest not very vaccinated and not very infected country is going to have to come up with an exit strategy uh, to reopen itself. Uh, I mean, just personally, I know a number of 
Chinese expats who have had a hard time uh, getting home for to see family, uh, and that's not to speak of all the trade and, and other things. They they can't maintain uh, a no COVID introductions policy, um, but yet their vaccine uptake is low. So I think um, that that's just going to be potentially, depending on how it's done, uh, uh, at least a, a big transition for for countries like that, um, and also potentially a source of new um, new high levels of uh, exposure for the rest of the world um, albeit the rest of the much of the rest of the world already being vaccinated a different situation has occurred in places that have had little vaccination but uh, but have not closed their borders um, and much of sub-saharan africa and some parts of asia and elsewhere um, are are in that category and um, for those I think the question is how much the immunity from uh, from prior infection is going to act like a vaccine probably not as good as a vaccine and certainly not as good as the combination of prior infection and a vaccine but to what degree that will um, protect those individuals again not from transmission and from seasonal epidemics and not all from severe disease, but will lower lower this into a more normal kind of disease process um, that we're used to from other diseases that have been around for longer. Yeah, um, you Mayor, how do you think about that? Do you think um, that you will we'll potentially see a different level of threat from COVID in different countries going forward? Like I think about how, you know, there's some disease like malaria is endemic in some countries, but not in others. Um, how could this play out in different in different countries across the world? Well, Carolyn, you know, I think we we don't even need to look at the future or path forward. I mean, it's already happened. I mean, we we've already seen that play out, and you know, policy decisions that have been made that uh, have uh, led to a difference in outcomes. Um, I, I do think we need to be very careful, though, when we when we do a a uh, cross-country analysis because uh, it is not an apple to apple comparison and so i remember even when i was in you know in uh texas and and people were trying to equate the population of texas and the uh, and you know the the geography with other countries and it was very different and now i'm in washington and you know it's a very different geography here obviously and uh, i do think to mark's point uh there are two things that are really critical one is access to vaccines and the other is this really ongoing investment and in access to healthcare. And um, you know, I'm I'm the the public health guy. I'm also a healthcare person, and I know it's not all about uh, healthcare. Obviously, I'm I'm very much uh, mindful of prevention and health and wellness and the overall collective piece that population health brings you. However, I do think in in many settings that access to vaccinations and the access to to healthcare, especially in a at a place where those factors are really driving outcomes, whether good or bad, uh, are really critical. And so when you have you know, countries that like a Haiti that has a markedly lower vaccination rate compared to a Canada, uh, it really does uh, lead to a number of different challenges. Not that they are not, uh, not that they cannot be um, overcome, that they're insurmountable, but I do think what that leads to is all of a sudden this differential investment in health overall Mm -hmm. then really leads to how do how do people then access health care and even those health services when you're in the midst of a pandemic or trying to to come out of it yeah um a question i get a lot uh nicole is what what do booster requirements look like going forward is this going to be something like the flu shot where we're going to have um you know annual shots to take and what are sort of the inputs that go into that decision and how that's going to look in future years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, currently what we do is we look very much at the antibody levels and everybody has, has been hearing that a lot about the dropping antibody levels and the need for a boost. And it's very clear when we give this boost that we increase these antibody levels, although that also differs on, on patient to patient. And the question is, uh, you know, at, at some point there are diminishing returns of how often we can boost and expect to to see an outcome. So, so that is a question. That said, um, 
uh, this the, currently the recommendation for that third boost uh, were very important and has uh, led to really increased immunity. And that just last week were a couple of really promising studies coming out to show that that third um, vaccination for those that had, uh, you know, Pfizer and Moderna has really led to not only an increase in antibodies, which do seem to wane over time, but really the long lasting immunity, the changes in the immune response, the cells that can rapidly get activated if we get infected again. So it may not prevent us from getting infected or prevent us from severe outcomes. And those are really helped by the boost. and. Um, and then somewhat surprisingly, may, uh, maybe the recent studies that suggested that, you know, adjusting the vaccine to, to make it Omicron specific uh, actually didn't have the sort of expected beneficial uh, outcomes. So, so in contrast to flu, where we, where we adjust every year to the virus, it's not clear right now whether that also needs to happen for, for, um, for the uh, coronaviruses. Got it. Um, well, it will be really interesting to see what the data says as more of these studies go underway. And yes. also, I know people, some people working on pan coronavirus vaccines. So I think that's all. Um, yes. And other countries such as Israel, for example, have gone to, to do a fourth shot for some. And so we're awaiting to see whether this is actually long term beneficial or not. Yeah. yeah. I have a question for everybody on the panel, which is um, what have we learned? Uh, in this pandemic that should help us prepare better for the next public health crisis, whatever it is. Uh, what are concrete steps towards a more robust public health system in the U.S.? Well, you know, Carolyn, I would I would just start with um, the the investment in public health. Uh, you know, a lot of what we have seen uh, that has played out during this pandemic um, been a lot of finger points that have gone towards the sector of public health and you know why couldn't you have done this faster why why weren't those systems available why weren't you know why weren't uh, the staffing um, uh, to these levels or why didn't you have the right uh, technologies and that all goes to ongoing um, you know honestly this just value system where we have continued to value healthcare and to the detriment of, of investment in public health and investment in these very systems that are needed. And it's, it, it is not a one time. So I'm, I'm very appreciative, for example, of, of uh, the federal uh, uh, government that has said, okay, look, we're gonna go ahead and get dollars into the public health system, but it has to be scalable. It has to be sustainable. It has to be strategic. It has to be smart. We have to really look at public health investment as an investment investment in community and investment in health and protection. And until we do that, we're going to continue to have this situation where no matter what the next pandemic or emergency or even the everyday chronic disease or what have you, we are going to continue to, to really not be do right by our communities because we have just not invested and the value system is just not in the right place. Yeah. Um, I'm curious in the conversations you've had so far, do you think people are um, getting that message because we've done this many times. I mean, there's the whole term of the panic and neglect cycle in public health. And, you know, after Ebola, money came in and then money went away. Uh, do you think it's going to be different this time? You know, it's funny. I, I, I think you're asking me, so, I'll, you know, H1N1, Ebola, Zika, you know, multiple hurricanes, all sorts of emergencies, global earthquakes. I'll tell you, it is absolutely true that uh, we react uh, and we try to throw those dollars back in and say, now we have solved the problem rather than being proactive about the capacity and capabilities that are necessary to have a robust system. I, um, at times during this pandemic was, was very hopeful that that an optimistic, yes, 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 it's going to happen. This is the one. And the more that I really think about this, I think about it from the, from the, standpoint of there are two ways to end this pandemic. One is what I call transactional. 
that it's one and done and we sort of wipe our hands and we you know, uh, move to the next headline. We as Americans are very good at that. What's the next big shiny object? The other is to be transformational, is to say, what are the collective experiences and what have we learned? What have we experienced? And put that back into the hopper for the future and really transform our systems. If I went to Congress today and said, I need more dollars for epidemiologists or contact tracers, I would be laughed out of the building. Yet a year ago, that was exactly what the dollars were coming for. Uh, so I am actually now not as optimistic as I as I was previously, but I do think we still have an opportunity to be transformational. And if we do that, then absolutely we can we can go there. But I'm I'm just maybe beaten down a little bit from this two plus years of responding. So yeah, honest Our, answer. <laughs> yeah, I I think um, the building of trust is really important. One of the most frustrating things to me was that I thought it would take us a while to get the vaccine and we need to sort of tie ourselves over and 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 maybe the vaccine we get is not really that great. And, and all of this didn't happen, right? We had this fantastic vaccine. We have these fantastic vaccines and there's a considerable, there's a considerable doubt of whether that vaccine really is as good as people say it is and what it could do. And so, and I think it is because um, we, we, need to, we need to have a constant voice that people trust that when they make hate recommendation, that these are seen as not political, not coming for a particular reason, not to make money or, you know, and, and really um, uh, part of the normal message. And then when something like this happens, uh, people will look to that entity. And, and I think the, the, the sort of um, CDC used to be that voice and it didn't play that voice this time. And we need to get that back, I think. And and then uh, I think we would have more people trusting that what is being recommended will actually um, be done and is for good reason. Yeah. Mark, what do you think about steps for the future, changes we should make? Yeah. Well, I think the a lesson that's really in a way the same one as Nicole's mentioning, but but has another dimension is the importance of leadership. And especially in our country, that lack of trust was a direct product in part of divisive leadership uh, at the beginning. Um, and I think once the die was cast, it's been very hard to undo that. Um, uh, I think the other piece that uh, I'm very uh, enthusiastic about in my other role as I'm on loan this year to the CDC to help set up a new center for forecasting and outbreak analytics, um, I think the role of data um, and the ability of uh, data to move from the states to the federal government and back again, the ability of um, systems to talk to each other uh, is is really critical for making better decisions. And that doesn't just mean figuring out how to interrupt people's lives more. It really means figuring out when to stop interrupting people's lives just as much. Um, I'm in the UK right now and, and I've come in order to learn what they uh, what they did to set up really the world's best studies uh, of, of the community transmission and other aspects of COVID and the degree to which they've linked their uh, clinical, their census and their genomic data is just extraordinary. Um, and I think uh, that is the way that 21st century pandemics can be fought. Uh, but we, we have a long way to go in the United States. Well, the bar is low. I think a lot of um... Uh, my readers were really surprised to hear how many health departments run on fax machines in the United States still. So I think you're right that there is a lot, a long way to go there. Um, great. I, I think Connor has joined us at this point to bring some of our audience questions. And yeah, now we're going to pivot to uh, the audience portion of the event. Um, before we do that, uh, just quickly, I, I dropped in a link uh, to an event survey. If you wouldn't mind just taking a, a few minutes to fill that out, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, but now on to audience questions. Um, so sort of sticking with um, what uh, Mark was just saying about um, improving uh, data and our use of it. Um, Umer or uh, Caroline, this question could be for you. Um, as as we do shift, uh, as we do enter this new phase of COVID, um, 
you know, how will public health metrics evolve um, in this next stage? And what will, what will we continue to use case rates to determine mitigation measures? Uh, Nicole, you want me to go first? Yep. Yeah, you know, I, I would say that, you know, we, we do know that case rates are important. Um, they are a number though of uh, other metrics that are there. And the reason I say that is the more and more we uh, work to decentralize or empower people to get tested at home or to have you know, a way to, um, to do rapid tests, to make individual decisions, we have less and less a picture of what's occurring. Now, I, you know, over time you can monitor the number of at-home tests that are, you know, that are, that are ordered and maybe more like a syndromic surveillance, use that as we did previously with uh, uh, antipyretics and say, okay, acetaminophen or Tylenol or aspirin and try to follow that around. But really, honestly, what happens is that we get less and less a picture of what's happening. And so really it's this transition to more of uh, almost as we've done with influenza, a, a targeted focused surveillance system that really to Mark's point about uh, analytics, that it really is very much not as, as individual human dependent as it is the actual machine learning, if you will, the AI aspects of it that really allow us to, to really determine what's happening. I think genomic sequencing, which is something that we in the state of Washington are, are very much uh, one of the leaders with, with um, our genomic uh, program with our laboratory, I will tell you that that is also a sequencing aspect that for the future. So there's a lot that is very much about where we're going, but I think as we see a lot of these metric, uh, these uh, requirements and mandates come off, uh, a lot of public health officials are really looking at hospital metrics and healthcare metrics rather than the case rates. And Omicron obviously showed why that was not as important. So uh, maybe that helps. And maybe Nicole has some additional thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think the uh, testing is, um, I think the sequencing is really what is so important and the collection of, of data points throughout, even when we think there's nothing, nothing going on, as we saw you know, unfortunately, South Africa was sort of punished for actually coming up with the sequences of the Omicron early on, right? But, but um, we we need to maintain a grip on on the circulating viruses and the variants that are coming, so that that um, we we know why why this comes. Unfortunately, right now that we we sort of after the fact, right? We, we know it's there and then it's already too late because um, uh, it has already spread. So if we could get ahead of it rather than running behind and just confirming that what we are already seeing, I think that would be very useful and taking a, a chapter out of the flu, um, what we're doing with influenza where we have set up these surveillance systems so that we can see what is happening in the different parts of the world and then um, uh, maybe develop a new vaccine or have other strategies or alert people ahead of time that it's time to maybe change behavior again. That would be idea. Yeah, and I, I would just like to add, I think, you know, case rates were the best we had in most parts of the United States. They're not the best the best indicator either because of all the things that go into who can get tested, who, how long it takes, uh, whether the test is, is sensitive, et cetera. Um, and really the gold standard is, again, what the, what the UK did, which is to have random samples of the population tested uh, at, at intervals. And that's what they used for surveillance. Their case rates were a, a secondary consideration by far. Uh, and that's not that hard to set up. It costs money, but it doesn't, it's not, um, it's not that hard to set up, but it, it has to be done uh, carefully and with some design in, in, pre in, in the process. Thank you guys. Um, and just as a reminder, if you have a question, uh, if you just click the q and icon at the bottom of the screen, you can type it there. Um, Sticking with you, Mark, uh, someone asked in the chat, uh, given the Omicron spike we saw in December, do you think we've reached the herd immunity needed to make this an endemic virus? Yeah, that's a question that uh, I get a lot in different forms. Um, and I think one thing that's really important to, to, well, let me first answer it. I think possibly so for the moment but for the moment is, is possibly on the order of months, not on the order of uh, someone's lifetime. 
Um, and the reason I say that is that we're, we're, um, we're used to thinking about herd immunity in the uh, infectious disease world as something uh, where uh, immunity from a prior infection or, uh, or a vaccination is almost complete and, and lasts for many decades. And that's immunity to, to transmitting. Herd immunity de depends on immunity to transmitting the virus, not just immunity to getting sick. And we've seen with COVID that uh, as time passes and as variants emerge, and especially with the combination of, say, people whose vaccination or, uh, or probably to some extent prior infection, although it's less clear, is old and they get Omicron, they're not as protected. So herd immunity is not a like a place you get to and stay. It's a place that we're constantly moving up and down uh, on. And so we may be at a very high level of herd immunity now, but that doesn't mean we'll stay there. Um, and so that would be that that model, which makes sense for measles and mumps and rubella and a lot of other things, really doesn't make sense uh, for a disease that's where the vaccine, where the where the immunity is is less long lived. Um, and that's why people get coronaviruses every couple of years um, or every several years uh, the, with the normal endemic ones that herd immunity does not ever get reached permanently. Nicole, do you want to weigh in on uh, how this latest surge? Yeah, I mean, yeah and I think it, it, in part it has to do also with the vaccines that we have are fantastic at inducing what we call systemic immunity. So that's immunity that, that sort of protects your body from, from um, harboring the virus for a long time. But it doesn't provide the, the immunity in your nose and the upper respiratory tract that is required for preventing this infection. And, and once you get infected, you replicate the virus, right? And so um, maybe in, uh, and so there are some attempts right now to maybe have booster vaccines that actually will, uh, will induce that immunity. The, the, the problem with that is we, we don't know how long lasting this local immunity in the respiratory tract in your nose is. And so whether this idea of herd immunity that you can really prevent this virus from coming in, whether we can reach that, uh, whether we have this long lasting immunity, the system in the, uh, in the respiratory tract to, to actually make that possible. Um, and sticking with you, Nicole, uh... So flu has been an endemic virus that uh, kills unvaccinated people every year. Could you compare and contrast what a COVID-19 endemic environment, environment would look like compared to the annual flu? Yeah, I think I think what I mean, uh, coronaviruses and, and can infect, of course, and we know that uh, our pets and, and other animals, but the kind of um, nature of flu is that it lives in 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 these uh, foul populations and and um which is generating new influenza viruses every year and so we are for that reason uh testing always what is coming out and often we get it right and but sometimes we get it wrong right and so uh but we know about when it's coming right it's coming in the winter months right now the um, uh, the the coronavirus spikes we see come every three months i mean that's about what it is um and and uh, so we don't know we don't know why uh, it, there is this interval uh we don't know whether there are animals that are actually harboring it um and so I think that we are not at a point yet where we could really know whether it becomes like flu. And then the final point I would like to make is that when we think about flu, we are thinking about, you know, mild respiratory infections uh, and so on. But uh, for everybody who lived in 2009, we had the scare of the last um, influenza uh, reassort. And so that flu virus looked quite different from the one we had the years before, and we didn't have uh, pre-existing immunity. And so we would have these scares uh, where we don't have the vaccine that doesn't really work. So of course, and that could happen uh, with coronaviruses, of course, as well, that we get uh, relatively mild infections, and then we get these uh, mutants appearing. But right now, it, it happens so frequently that we are far away from what we have with flu. Thank you. And then, Umer, I wanted to bring you back in. Um, is there good transnational information sharing among public health professionals about outbreaks and variants? And if not, uh, where is this still falling short? 
Yeah, Connor, thanks. You know, again, this is where the investment in systems and investment in public health come in. Um, and, and Nicole mentioned earlier, you know, this, the role of the CDC is not just to be the public health leader in the United States or in the domestic realm, but it is to be our conduit of information on a bi-directional manner with our global partners. And then obviously the World Health Organization with WHO has traditionally been where we also look at the global umbrella organization, if you will, that then allows for transfer of knowledge back and forth. But I do also say that we have uh, learned a lot during this pandemic, but even prior to this pandemic, we recognize the importance again of those technologies that would allow for transfer of information across borders. Look, if if a virus or a bacteria or, or an infection does not know borders, neither should our public health response to the information sharing. And so it's, it, we have to match the threats that are, that are uh, upon us. And if we are not going to be able to match that, if the virus goes faster than us, or if information travels faster than, than we're ready or capable to be able to process it, then shame on us, because we're never going to be at a point where we're going to be able to respond to very quick in-time emergencies and threats to our population. So um, yes, that system is in place, but I do think there are opportunities to improve on those systems. And I, I did want to make one additional comment, Connor, which I, I did want to nestle in somewhere. Um, which is that we have also learned another aspect, which is the importance of uh, communication. And, um, you know, I know that all of us believe in science, all of us believe in the importance of data, all of us the importance of, of you know, how do, we, how do we share knowledge. But we, um, and I'll go back to my own training and, um, you know, from medical school, residency, fellowship, um, I can really count on, on maybe a very small finger, the amount of times that I had a, a formal discourse in communications, in debate, in dialogue, in, in how do you really speak to people who don't always agree with you. We get that in the patient setting, but we don't always get that in the population health setting. And why that is so critical is that I do believe that we start with science, but we cannot end with science. We have to be very good at translating that information and the currency of trust with the communities because we are of those communities. And I think that's where we, we missed the boat. So when in Washington, a lot of folks were you know concerned about vaccinations for kids, I didn't start with, I'm the secretary of health for the state of Washington or as an ER doctor or as a public health professional. I started with as a parent. And I think we miss that. And oftentimes we are told not to bring that into the mix. And I think that's what then further separates us from the very people that we're trying to connect with. And that also includes on social media, of course. Yeah, thank you. Just to get back on the international thing, I think it's worth uh, calling out the, the very good example of South Africa um, providing to the world in a very rapid and comprehensive and sophisticated way the information on Omicron um, <clears throat> followed very quickly by careful analyses of, of what its potential for spread was um, because they happened to get it first. Um, that was a remarkable decision uh, uh, that was, like many good decisions, rapidly punished by uh, closures of borders um, that, that probably long outlasted their usefulness uh, in much of the rest of the world. and and caused harm to not just South Africa, but much of Southern Africa. Um, and fortunately, that, that harm was temporary and the, the borders have largely been reopened. But um, uh, I think, A, the, the fact that it was South Africa and not uh, many other countries was fortunate uh, in the sense that they uh, had the infrastructure to, to do the work and share the work. and also that um, we need to change the incentives uh, such that um, countries don't get punished for such uh, valuable warnings that they provide to the world. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people wrote in concerned about long COVID. Uh, Nicole, I was hoping you could speak to uh, what looms as a post-pandemic COVID-19 generated health effects. Are there are there things you have your eye on? 
Well, I think what it what it um, demonstrated is that there's long term effects after an acute infection are, are real and not in people's heads, you know, and there are many diseases where we have observed that and it's more anecdotal because the numbers are just not there. So I, I just bring up Lyme disease, which is one of those examples where people are often told it's all in their heads, right? Having so many people infected now and with that, uh, even if it's a small proportion of those that have these long COVID uh, symptoms, um, um, it, it is a, a large number of patients. And, and now we have a group of patients that we can study and that have been studied. And, and it is very clear that um, uh, um, and uh, what that these are real effects. And so we, we are beginning to see a pattern of what underlying conditions are that are associated with this long COVID, um, um, you know, um, comorbidities such as diabetes, which have been long identified to, to make COVID worse. Um, and some we can't do anything about, um, but one of them is the, um, uh, the how much virus is actually in the blood. And that, of course, has to do with our vaccination status and our immune status. That is also an underlying. So that is one thing we can actually work against it So um, and, and can uh, prevent by getting vaccinated. So that would be my recommendation that um, it clearly seems to have an effect on the number of people that are developing this long COVID. But um, I think this is going to stay with us for a long time. We have to figure out uh, what we can do for these patients that is more than just symptomatic treatment. And um, uh, I think there's a lot of research that needs to be done. Yeah. Um, and going back to Mark's research on the UK health system, what are, what are the main pain points blocking the US from centralizing health data across symptoms in your view? Uh, across sy systems, I think I think you meant. Um, uh, well, I think the the main th there are a number. One is uh, the one that's hardest to solve is the fact that we have many healthcare systems, and for some people, we have no healthcare system um, rather than one. And so, the and the payer and the provider are in most cases separate, um, which means that there is nobody who has uh, really comprehensive records on most people's health that are um, that are easy to um, well that, that have been that people have figured out ways to uh, standardize and and make sense of um, there's a lot of good work going on in trying to make electronic medical records more more useful um, but because there are so many different kinds uh, that's that's a big challenge um, in so many different systems um, a, a, a so I think that's one. Um, I think the second is that uh, right now the state public health uh, systems and the federal public health systems don't share as much data as they could. Um, and the states are uh, in many cases free to share or not share with the with fed, federal government and um, that makes it harder uh, from the at least from the federal perspective, to uh, have a national picture. Um, the, the final thing I would say is that um, a lot of what the UK has succeeded in is linking uh, different kinds of data. Um, and we don't have a system for doing that yet, although uh, the CDC is working on, on trying to link certain kinds of data um, that are in the public health system and just haven't been properly linked yet. Um, so, so I think there are some very bright spots, um, uh, but I think uh, a combination of continuing these efforts and for pandemic preparedness, planning to set up random samples of, of the population uh, to understand what's going on in future pandemics is kind of the best way forward. Great. Um, and then this will be our last question. Um, so what is one thing you wish everyone knew? Um, and this is for everyone. Uh, is there a common misconception that you like to clarify or a take home message for our audience? What, what would you say? I can start because we're throwing this at everybody without, um, and I'll give you some time to think. Um, 
I have two thoughts. One, which is, as we've heard from our experts today, this pandemic has exposed a lot of existing flaws in our healthcare system that we knew were there, the experts knew were there, but maybe we hadn't paid attention to, which range from underfunding of public health, as Yumer said, um, inequities in our uh, system in terms of health access and, you know, a lack of technology and communication, as Mark has said. And I, th- I, my hope is that even though everybody is eager for this pandemic to end, that we will not miss this opportunity to learn from this and be ready for the next healthcare crisis because another one will come for sure. Um, and my other thought as a member of the media here, which I think was touched on also when Nicole talked about trust is, I think we have often underestimated the audience. Um, this is both leaders and reporters like myself because we've oversimplified messages to say things like, don't buy a mask. You know, when the concern was really like, we might not have had enough supply um, and we presume that the public could not understand nuance. And so I think that is something that I've thought about a lot. You know, the how reporters can help convey clearly nuance and I don't know being a fair answer. And that's something I will definitely be taking forward with me. You mayor? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, great. You, you're you eloquent and now you throw it to me. Uh, I, I, you know, I would say all of the above, uh, I, you know, and I agree with all of that. And I would also say that the this pandemic is not over and uh, we are, are continuing with the headlines that look, things are better and then everybody just stops doing the things that are making it better. And now all of a sudden we get back into trouble. But we um, also should take the lesson away that uh, there is so much that we have to do to invest in the true long term. And if we believe this is the last time we're going to have this kind of a situation, shame on us. It's happened, like you said before, Ebola, Zika, I mean, all sorts of other, even H1N1 and way prior to that. And we've had all sorts of opportunities. Let's not lose the the, the fact and the sight of the fact that this is going to continue on for uh, our, our path forward is really uh, requiring us to continue to invest for the long term. Yeah, what I, what I would say, it's became very clear that you can't act alone and that you have to act as a collective. And, and I think we have failed um, acting as a collective. Um, and, and I think it has come to our detriment to do so. We haven't vaccinated everybody. And so we have Omicron emerging from, from Africa, a continent that has a very small number of vaccinated individuals. And um, even in this country, we haven't really acted as a collective. And, and I think if we if we want to be better prepared and, and look better and, and have better outcomes for the next pandemic, we, we need to understand that we can only beat this as a collective. Well, I'll, I'll end on a slightly upbeat note, which is not my usual note, um, but, but I think um, if, we, if we had had this pandemic in 2015, I think vaccines would be just coming around, maybe around now. Um, And it was investments made by the scientific community, uh, by pharmaceutical companies to some degree, but especially by NGOs and and by uh, government research entities that decided that we needed to be prepared with vaccines for the next pandemic. And as it happens, they were lucky to be working on mRNA platforms and on um, and on uh, coronaviruses. but that bit of foresight really paid dividends. And <clears throat> as many bad things as we can say about this pandemic, I think it probably bought us, I'm, I'm guessing, but around a year uh, of uh, 2021 being a nice, uh, partly nice year instead of a, uh, another horrible year like 2020. Um, so on that note i think the things that everybody's been talking about about improving our communication uh, improving our um, preparedness on data improving our preparedness on public health uh, resources and improving uh, building up the public health workforce all of that is really evident lessons of uh, this pandemic just as the need for rapid vaccines were evident lessons from the ebola 
uh, crisis of 2014-15. Um, so I hope that we can uh, replicate that success rather than the, uh, the cycle of, of neglect that you talked about earlier. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, well, that's all our time for today. Uh, I want to thank each of our panelists, Umer, Mark, Nicole, and our moderator, Caroline. Thanks to McKinsey and Company for their support and to our media partner, STAT. And of course, a big thank you to everyone who joined us for this important conversation.